Welcome to this um, first webinar of the Siena Sherpa and Penelfit projects, setting future ethical standards for ICT, big data, smart information systems, artificial intelligence, and robotics. That's a mouthful. In this uh, shared webinar, we want to tell you about the three projects. These are currently the three largest European projects focused on ethical and human rights aspects of um, information and communication technology, especially uh, big data, artificial intelligence, and uh, data processing and transfer. So my name is Philip Bray. I am coordinator of the Siena project. And I will start off by a shared introduction also on behalf of the coordinators of Sherpa and Penelfit of uh, our three projects. So um, as you can see here, um, the coordinator of the Sherpa project is Professor Bernd Stahl uh, in the UK. And in Spain, we have the coordinators of Penelfit, uh, Inigo de Miguel uh, Beren and Carlos Marie Romeo. <coughs> Um, our next steps going forward, um, this is our next slide. So these are three European projects funded by the European Union's uh, Rise in 2020 scheme. Um, they are projects aimed to help improve existing ethical, human rights and legal frameworks for ICT development and research in Europe. They uh, all started um, almost simultaneously roughly in the same year. And they're both um, three and a half, all, all three of them three and a half year projects. Uh, so because of the overlap in focus, we have decided to collaborate. So what do these acronyms actually mean? Uh, because our names are acronyms. Siena means stakeholder informed ethics for new technologies with high socioeconomic and human rights impact. Um, Sherpa means shaping the ethical dimensions of smart information systems, a European perspective. And Panelfit is participatory approaches to a new ethical and legal framework for ICT. That doesn't yet tell you everything about the projects, but it's, it's a start. Um, so we're all concerned with ethical, legal, and human rights aspects of information and communication technology with uh, different uh, emphasis and focus. But So why collaborate? Well, we want to actually co-create outputs um, with and for policymakers and stakeholders and end users. We think if we uh, co-create outputs, they will be better outputs uh, and more effective outputs. We also want to deliver complementary guidance for software developers, industry policymakers, researchers, and citizens. Again, by developing our guidance together, we can achieve more mass and focus. Uh, we also want to ensure that expertise and experiences that we have can help improve existing policy and the policymaking process. And we want to build synergies for optimal communication and dissemination policy to maximize our, the impact of our projects. So these are all good reasons to collaborate, we think. Uh, here you see a picture depicting the different uh, focus of our projects. So we're all concerned with three topics, AI, big data, and data sharing. And of course, there's a lot of activity in these areas currently. Um, everything nowadays seems to be about data and about AI in the ICT field. Um, the Siena project, uh, first of all, has perhaps the uh, largest focus on artificial intelligence. Um, it uh, considers the full field of artificial intelligence as well as robotics. And we also look at human enhancement and genomics, so we don't all only look at ICT, and we study ethics and human rights implications. Um, the Sherpa project has a focus on AI and big data, and especially the combination of the two, how uh, big data systems and applications 
are becoming more and more intelligent and what are the ethical and human rights implications of that. And then finally, PanelFit has a big focus on data and data sharing. Um, it uh, looks broadly at information and communication technology. It has mostly a legal perspective. It looks, and it looks particularly at data commercialization, informed consent, and cybersecurity. So you see there's overlap between these three interests, and we want to exploit that overlap. So this then marks the start of an active European collaboration in the ethics and human rights of emerging digital technologies. And we hope you will enjoy our presentations. After the web webinar, you will receive an email with more information on how to connect with us and engage with us, because we cannot do this without your help. Uh, to make these projects successful, uh, stakeholder engagement and interaction is very important to us. So we look forward to your input. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. So my name is uh, Philip Bray. I am coordinator of the Siena project. I am a professor in ethics at the University of Twente. And I want to tell you a bit about our Siena project and how it is focused on developing ethical guidelines for artificial intelligence. So um, I'm going to talk about our approach for the development of ethical guidelines. So, um, of course, ethical guidelines for AI have been developed already by various parties. Um, we will be the first project, we feel, where we do so um, on the basis of a thorough academic approach and extensive stakeholder consultation. We actually take three years to do this. Um, so we're going to tell you about our approach and then the ethical analysis we did so far in working towards uh, these guidelines. So what is our approach? Well, first of all, we have uh, as objectives to develop three sets of ethical guidelines. Uh, first of all, we want to develop policy guidelines for ethical AI, which will be similar to the guidelines that have been recently developed by the high-level expert, expert, expert group on AI, but we want to uh, build, build on them, but um, provide more detail and rigor. Secondly, uh, we want to uh, develop specific professional guidelines for AI scientists and engineers uh, working on the development of um, artificial intelligence systems and software. And uh, third, we want to develop guidelines for AI for research ethics committees. Now we have an eight-step program uh, taking us two and a half years to complete. We're currently in the middle of this for the development of these guidelines, uh, working with stakeholders on making this happen. First, uh, we recently completed a socioeconomic impact assessment of and foresight analysis of possible future developments and impacts of artificial intelligence over the next 20 years. Because we believe um, we want to have as much information as possible on potential future developments of AI, not just looking at AI as it, is, as it exists now, but um, what is likely or at least plausible to happen in the coming years so that we are prepared for future developments. Secondly, we want to have a good analysis of the legal context of AI and looking at relevant international norms, legal orders, and national legislations, because uh, we believe we shouldn't develop ethical guidelines and analysis in a vacuum. You want to consider uh, legislation that's already out there or being developed. Uh, third and fourth, we want to know what people think and feel about AI, because we want our, our guidelines to have to be as democratic as possible. For that reason, we want to do a public opinion survey as well as consult citizens in a panel of citizens, uh, five panels actually um, in different EU countries. So uh, 
This is something we actually recently completed, and we're now at the reporting stage where we will be writing reports uh, to present our results to the world. We did a public opinion survey um, interviewing 11,000 people in 11 countries uh, about their acceptance of artificial intelligence. How do they feel about AI and what do they think uh, how do they think it should be developed and used and should not be developed and used? And then we did the same in more depth in five EU panels of citizens, where we um, got 50 people together, uh, cross-section from the countries in which they were performed. And um, we asked citizens uh, what they thought. Currently, we're also in the middle of an ethical analysis and evaluation of AI based on these previous steps, as well as on desk analysis and expert workshops. So we're inviting experts, um, especially in ethics, but also in um, the technologies themselves. We also do uh, an extensive consultation of the existing academic literature uh, on the ethical aspects of AI. Based on all that, we will this fall propose a new ethical framework for AI technology. And based on that, um, also look at existing ethical guidelines and codes to develop, eventually develop ethical guidelines based on our ethical framework. And those ethical guidelines will be of three types, um, as mentioned before. Uh, first will be ethical policy guidelines. Um, which, in which we will collaborate with Council of Europe, UNESCO, and other advisory, advisory and regulatory bodies, especially, of course, in the European Union and its member states. We will also develop operational guidelines for research ethics committees for AI. Here we will collaborate with EUREC, which is the European Association of Research Ethics Committees, uh, as well as the National Research Ethics Committee Associations. Uh, associated with uh, UREC. And third, we will develop a code of responsible conduct for AI, AI and robotics researchers in collaboration with organizations like IEEE, ACM, uh, uh, Eurobotics, uh, Council of European Professional Information Societies, and others. So, as said before, we want to really engage stakeholders in this process, hear what they have to say, um, uh, both as experts and as bearers of interest in this matter. So we engage a lot of engineers, uh, computer scientists, social scientists, ethicists. We have people involved from industry, government, civil society of all kinds uh, to hear their voices and to come to joint ideas and plans as well as over 11,000 citizens uh, whom we interview and engage. So let uh, me tell you something about our results so far. As I said, we're in the middle of this, but we have some results to share. Um, first, um, we want to do an ethical analysis where we recognize not just general ethical issues in AI. I mean, there's all these guidance lists where it's about accountability, fairness, transparency, et cetera, et cetera. We do that, but for us, that's only part of the work. We also want to look at ethical issues unique to particular AI systems and techniques. For example, we want to look at specific ethical issues with smart big data systems or effective computing or social robotics, et cetera. And we want to look at ethical issues unique to particular application areas like defense, like education, government, agriculture, et cetera, et cetera. So here we, we already think we distinguish ourselves from other projects in this way. Um, if you look at the general ethical issues uh, as a preliminary analysis, um, you can see that we look at um, ethical values or principles that we think are important uh, for AI to adhere to. Um, many of those will probably be familiar to you uh, if you are familiar with the literature, for example, the high-level ethics group or the um, European group in ethics. Uh, 
Um, so we're looking at autonomy and control, privacy, well-being, dual use, uh, equality, responsibility, accountability, transparency, uh, the issues of employment, democracy, as well as the general desirability of intelligent automation. So for each of these um, ethical issues, we do an extensive uh, ethical analysis, looking at the existing literature, uh, surveying arguments pro and con, and looking at implementation. Then we also look at ethical issues of AI systems and techniques, uh, where we discover a lot of different types of systems and techniques. This is only a selection, what you see here. And for each of those, we look at specific ethical issues. For example, computer vision raises specific ethical issues that have to do with recognizing and tracking people and um, uh, uh, the ethics of that are different again than the ethics for social robots where it's about human robot interaction and uh, what can all go wrong in that uh, to people's uh, rights and, and well-being. And then third, we also look at ethical issues and application domains. This, these are the application domains that we're focusing on. So uh, as you can imagine, the ethical issues with AI and defense raise to an extent different ethical issues than um, does the application of AI in healthcare or in media and entertainment. Um, in one, for example, there's uh, the, the threat to democracy um, with uh, social media applications, for example. In defense, it's, it's about killer robots and autonomous systems that can kill. So uh, different ethical issues to be considered in those different domains. So um, I can go on and on, but uh, I think I'm at the end of my time. Um, as you can see, there's lots of uh, ethical issues to be considered here, and we want to do so in a way that's going to be helpful for uh, policymakers, developers, and practitioners and users in the field. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Bernd Stahl. I'm a professor at the Montfort University, which is located in Leicester in the United Kingdom, and I'm the coordinator of the Sherpa project. So Sherpa, the acronym stands for Shaping the Ethical Dimensions of Information Technology a European perspective. Um, what are we doing in the Sherpa project? Oops, let me. Um, so we um, use the term smart information systems as a core term uh, defining the range of activities of the project. And uh, I therefore need to say a little bit about what we mean by smart information systems because it's um, slightly outside the, the current discourse. So what you see on the screen now is a representation of smart information systems. These are characterized by what we call technical drivers, and that's where we see artificial intelligence, in particular the type of artificial, uh, artificial intelligence application that are very um, highly debated at the moment. So we're talking about uh, neural networks, uh, machine learning, um, and these are um, based on big data, so they need data to be trained. Um, so the combination of artificial intelligence and big data is at the core of what we call smart information systems. But these are never just used in isolation. They're always linked to other types of technologies. So they have what we call enabling technologies. Uh, those are technologies that either produce the data, and that may be all sorts of data from social media data to um, neuro uh, stimulation data, uh, you name it. Uh, so they produce the data, but they also then do something with the data. So they, they use the output of the uh, artificial intelligence uh, algorithms to do something in the world. And again, there's a, a broad variety of um, technologies that can do that. So it could be effective computing applications, it could be robotics, it could be many things. So that what we mean, that's what we mean by smart information systems. Um, and we're interested in ethics and human rights of these uh, technologies. Now, a lot of the debate you hear in the public around ethics and human rights um, of these technologies focuses on the perceived negative aspects. So before we go there, and we will also talk about those, uh, but before I go there, um, I think it's important to underline that it's not just about negatives. So these technologies 
also have a lot of benefits, and these benefits um, are very broad, but they have an important moral component to them, um, and therefore those uh, technologies um, can also have um, ethical justifications. So one of those is that global challenges, um, such as the ones um, formulated in the Sustainable Development Goals, may be capable of being promoted through the use of these technologies. And you see uh, on this slide a, a short advertising of last year's AI for Good Summit, uh, where the core of the discussion about, was about how AI can be made useful for the Sustainable Development Goals. There is a lot of emphasis on economic growth, and economic growth is seen as not just an economic benefit, but because there are um, increasing wealth and well-being effects to it, uh, it's also seen as a moral um, a good. These technologies pr are promising us to provide better, better services, personalized services, which can be used for, for consumer goods, but they can also be very helpful for people who have limited abilities, uh, so they can uh, increase our human capabilities in many different ways. Um, they can, for example, compensate for disabilities, but they can also allow us to do things which uh, human beings might have wanted to do, but were not able to do. So there's a possibility of, of greater inclusion, of uh, helping people to participate in their communities, uh, including democratic participation. And overall, this has the promise attached to it that these technologies can promote empowerment so they can help people achieve their potential better. However, at the same time, there are numerous ethical concerns and I'll go through those very quickly, partly because Philip has touched on them in the earlier presentation. Uh, the biggest one probably is uh, data protection and, and privacy, um, but there are all sorts of other social, economic uh, and, and other concerns that people raise. So a key one is uh, questions of the changes of employment now, it's an open question whether these technologies will lead to increased unemployment or maybe create more employment, but I think it's fairly obvious that there'll be a shift in employment. So some people will benefit and other, others will not, and that raises all sorts of questions around policy. Um, there are worries about concentrations of power and money, the big tech companies controlling the data, controlling the algorithms, um, and using these technologies to cement their market dominance further, and not just market, but then also their political dominance. Uh, there are worries around uh, loss of control by human beings whose uh, range of abilities um, is too much structured by the technologies. Uh, some people are worried about human enhancement, um, so changing the nature of what it means to be human. And we have specific concerns around things like transparency, where these technologies can um, introduce biases in decision making, which can lead to personal discrimination. But there are also issues around security, misuse, and uh, other human rights infringements. So there are lots of concerns. What do we do? So the Sherpa project is trying to um, start, or has started, with an attempt to represent these issues more clearly. And uh, the, the challenge that we are, we are facing here is that while there is a huge amount of discourse around ethics and human rights of AI and big data, um, there is very little empirical research um, across the board that shows what the implications of these technologies are. So uh, we've used this challenge to structure a number of activities. So we have undertaken 10 case studies of current smart information systems, uh, which range uh, across a number of application areas. These are uh, already available, or half of those approximately at this point are available on the website, but they'll soon be all there. Um, in addition to case studies which describe the present, we've developed a set of future-looking scenarios. I'll come to those in a minute. We also looked at the technical side, in particular the cyber threats. Uh, how does AI big data facilitate new cyber threats or um, what solutions might there be? Um, we are looking at the ethical impacts uh, very much along the lines uh, of what Philip talked about earlier. And we also have a specific um, stream of activities looking at human rights implications. So to give you a flavor of what we're doing, so the case studies, uh, these are just the, the, the topics of the case studies. Um, we've done one on the Internet of Things. Uh, we've looked at how governments use these technologies. Um, we've looked at smart cities, which are very closely related to governments. Uh, we looked at how scientific research, in particular in our case neurosciences, uh, use these technologies, but also how they may impact the future development of these technologies. 
so these are probably all technologies or application areas of these technologies that you would expect. Um, but we've also looked at things like agriculture, um, where it may be less obvious in the public mind that uh, there is a role to be played here by artificial intelligence. Um, we have looked at uh, the use of in insurance. Uh, we've looked at how energies and utilities companies um, use them, how communication and media. Uh, we've looked at retail and trade as well as manufacturing. So the idea here was to, to um, pick a range of important uh, application areas to see what the literature says around the ethical issues, but also what practice says. So we have, in all cases, uh, talked to people in organizations that use these technologies and try to find out whether uh, the representation of the ethical aspects in the literature corresponds to uh, the, the experience of people who make actual use of them. So in addition to this, so these case studies are all studies of uh, currently existing projects, systems, and so on. Uh, we've also um, wanted to understand how these things are going to play out in the future. We therefore developed a set of five scenarios, and these scenarios are set in the relatively short-term future, so we're talking about seven to uh, five years, so the mid-2020s. Um, where we've looked at what we can expect to happen in areas of predictive policing, uh, in, area, in the area of warfare, in mimicking technologies, which you may be aware, aware of under the name of deep fakes. Um, we've looked at education and we looked at autonomous vehicles. So this was an attempt to go beyond the, the current time horizon and extrapolate what we can expect in the future. Now this allows us to come up with a, an understanding of um, what these technologies are, how they play out in practice, but it's not good enough for us as a project to simply say what we think about them. Uh, it's very clear that these are uh, very broadly socially relevant technologies and therefore what we need is to understand the perceptions of competing rights and interests by stakeholders more broadly. In order to do that, uh, we've also defined a number of activities. We have a stakeholder board and the members of, those st of the stakeholder board um, you can see on the website if you're interested. Uh, we're doing a set of interviews with experts. We are about to launch a survey of uh, a thousand plus respondents, and we will also do a Delphi study uh, with experts to explore the way these uh, issues can be addressed. Now, understanding the technologies, understanding the ethical and human rights implications of these technologies doesn't necessarily lead to solutions. So uh, one challenge is to understand what are the options there? Uh, what can we actually do in terms of addressing them? And that's um, what we do in, uh, under this third challenge. Uh, we've defined something which we call the SIS workbook, which really is a page on, on our website where we collect all our insights, where we collect the case studies and the scenarios, but also, um, very importantly, possibilities and options in terms of addressing them. And some of the options that we've defined that we will explore in more detail are these here. So we're looking at guidelines for research and innovation of SIS. So what guidelines exist? What are the gaps in those guidelines and, and how can they be improved? Uh, we're looking at regulatory options and regulatory uh, in a broad sense from self-regulation all the way to um, top-down uh, le legislation. Um, we are exploring the possibility of standardization um, we're looking at whether there are technical options and what those might be. And as part of the regulatory uh, review, we're also looking at the possibility and or the need of a regulator. And we're thinking about um, exploring the, what a terms of reference for such a regulator might look like. Now, the idea is that uh, the, the response to this challenge will give us a number of options. Um, then the next question is, which of those options are the most important ones, which are the ones that we think need to be promoted. So we do this in uh, uh, response to this challenge four, which is the testing and validating of the solutions, where we will go back to stakeholders with our possible options and try to identify which ones are the most uh, significant ones. So we ha will have uh, stakeholder evaluation and validation, which will include a number of interviews, um, and we will focus on a set of focus groups. So we will do six focus groups across the EU with uh, ranges of stakeholders in order to find out what the most important solutions are. And the outcome of that will be a prioritization and the finalization of our recommendations. 
And that is, of course, something that we work with very closely with Sienna and PanelFit to ensure uh, that these recommendations are consistent um, and make sense in the light of the other projects. <clears throat> the final challenge that we face then is uh, how does this actually then feed back into the world? How do we have an impact? Uh, we do a number of the things that you would expect uh, any EU project to do, such as dissemination communication. Um, and this webinar is one aspect of that. Uh, but we also have two aspects that I think are not common in all EU projects. On the one hand, we have an artist on the consortium, so we, we are looking for novel ways of representing the challenges and the possible solutions um, that we encounter. And secondly, we have an explicit advocacy task where uh, the specific aim is to reach out to decision makers, uh, policy makers, but also other decision makers, in order to communicate our findings and our recommendations. So if you're interested in this, um, please join us, have a look at the website, and sign up to our stakeholder network. And uh, with this picture of the members of the consortium, I end my presentation. My name is Inigo de Miguel. I'm, uh, I work in the University of the Basque Country. Um, I'm I'm in, uh, involved in the panel project. I must uh, start by presenting uh, Carlos Romeo apologies. Uh, he apologizes because he cannot be present, so I will, I will be the one just presenting panel the project, okay? So uh, in order to start with our panel fit may might be a little bit different to the other projects, you know. Uh, firstly, because we are uh, mostly focused on the on legal, on legal perspective. Uh, we are also the youngest project in the sense that we have started a little bit uh, later than the other two. So we are, to say so, in our very beginning, we just started six months ago. So, well, I will start introducing the, the framework of the project, the, the idea that's uh, behind all of that. So the, the main point is that uh, we are just in a moment where everything is changing in the sense of the regulatory framework on data protection issues. It's really changing due to a number of different circumstances. Uh, one is that the, the general data protection regulation was put into force not so far ago, and we're just getting adapted to that. And uh, of course, it's, uh, it's making some troubles, <laughs> to be sincere. And, uh, on the other hand, it is quite clear that we have some conflicts in the sense that we, uh, as the European Union, we, we want to protect our citizens, we want to protect human rights, but on the other side, we are also willing to lead uh, somehow the digital single market. And there's an initiative on that. And uh, so it's, sometimes it's quite difficult to conciliate uh, the needs of the market and human rights as such. So the point is that uh, we, we, we have an idea in mind is that we must encourage the creation of data markets that enable per data commercialization while ensuring the protection of autonomy through the specific support of individual informed consent and supporting the implementation of sustainable security systems. So to say so, um, Panelfit is based on three main pillars. One is the commercialization, the other, maybe the most important one is informed consent, and the other one is uh, based on security and cybersecurity issues. So, Panelfit uh, has several objectives, um, mainly four of them. The first one is to facilitate the implementation of this new regulation. And I'm, I'm, we are not really talking only about the general data protection regulation, but all of the new regulation on, on that data uh, protection, data serving, data commercialization, uh, by producing a set of outcomes that serve as operational standards and practical guidelines, able to reduce the ethical and legal issues posed by ICT technologies, right? promoting innovation and market growth, et cetera, et cetera. We also want to suggest concrete improvements to the current regulatory and governance framework for the same purpose. We want to create multiple learning and support tools and promote networking among stakeholders and policymakers, 
and we want to increase the quantity and quality of the information available to policymakers, professionals, journalists, and lay people. I will come back to this uh, later on, but journalists are quite an important um, uh, people in, in, in the sense of panel feed because we consider that journalists are the ones who are somehow responsible to, to, to translate information to most population. Okay, people usually read uh, mass media. They don't really uh, appreciate, well, they appreciate, but it's a little bit harder for them to acquire information for specialized websites and journalists uh, play a different, a different and a key role in this. So they are important for us. So uh, how are we going to do this? Well, we are trying to produce a set of outcomes that will serve operational standards and practical guidance. Okay, so there are there will be seven main outcomes in, in panel fit. Of course, not all, not all of them share the same importance. And I think that, that uh, we, we should start with what is maybe the most important outcomes that we are willing to produce. And this the guidance on the ethical and legal issues of ICT research and innovation. This is more or less, um, or it's pretended to be a kind of handbook that should serve all those working in these areas to have a pretty good uh, tool to get all information needed about how to accomplish with the legal issues and try to do things as good as possible. Uh, it's mainly devoted to research ethic committees, data protection authorities, data protection officers, and so on. But we hope that even researchers uh, who are working on these can make good use of that. Okay, so um, it will both um, both will, will, will contain a lot of information about what's, uh, what is in the laws, but also some kind of uh, interpretation of these laws that might be helpful. I mean, we will be gathering information that's been produced by different sources and might serve well to understand what uh, a researcher is supposed to do while performing his or her research, that's the idea. And uh, why this? For what? Well, the main objective the proposal is to achieve efficiency, quality output, and uniformity of performance while reducing miscommunication and failure to comply with regulation. That's the point of this main outcome. Okay. We got so uh, how to produce this? Well. We will do a lot of different things, of course. We will do a lot of uh, this work and so on. And uh, we will introduce a lot of information regarding EU laws, but also about uh, the specifics of national regulation. Uh, to this purpose, we are creating a network of correspondence that will uh, report on the different um, peculiarities of each and every EU members okay uh, so the guidance will be quite interactive we will try to introduce a quite friendly friendly way of doing and they will be translated into five different languages mainly if i remember well english french italian german spanish okay uh, so the second outcome is the critical analysis on the ict data protection regulatory framework this is a little bit different this is uh, this is mainly directed uh, to policymakers who are the end users. And this is more or less a question that, uh, that we would like to, to try to suggest some improvements. Okay. This means that we will analyze all the, all the materials that we have, and we will try to identify issues that raise ethical concerns that have not been adequately addressed by the regulation. This, is, this includes, of course, the typical uh, issues and gaps analysis of the regulation, and we will try to to give some kind of concrete suggestions to improve the current situation. Okay, uh, the third outcome is a report on governance. This is a little bit different in the sense that we this report is mainly focused on the the way that the monitoring is being organized at the present moment. So. Um, we will try to analyze the issues and gaps related to the governance of the ethical and legal issues of ICT research and innovation and the monitoring of security and security compliance. Okay, so um, we will try to find out whether the current systems are working well, whether we could improve them in any way due to a lot of different 
uh, engagement tools. Okay. Uh, we will also try to develop a kind of platform for debate on mutual learning. That's what we call the mutual learning platform. It's an interactive tool and uh, that will serve as some repository of information and a platform for exchange of ideas. So um, those who are really working on these uh, issues and who are willing to share their thoughts and find some answers to the questions and so on uh, might ask for um, permission to be part of this community and uh, we could provide it if uh, we consider that, that that will be very interesting for all people involved. Okay, but it's more or less a tool devoted to try to share thoughts and information and find common solutions. Then we get some other outcomes. One is a code of conduct for responsible research and innovation that is mainly um, focused on researchers. And uh, this is meant to facilitate the primary aims of ethical compliance for, from the very beginning. Okay, So it's, it's, it's quite related to the ethics by design idea. And it's a question that, that we, well, we, we try to, to, to let researchers be aware of what they are expected to do from the very beginning and share some general ideas that, that could serve well to this purpose. Then we've got another outcome that's a kind of handle for journalists that uh, will be quite adapted to their own needs because they are quite um, um, a separate community. And uh, we will try to find out what all the main holes, I mean, no misunderstandings or maybe the the, the issues that journalists working on these topics um, share right now, and we will try to uh, write a kind of useful tool for them. Okay, so that's the point of this outcome. And then we, we have a, finally a kind of citizens info pack. It's a set of, of various material prepared to informally people in a highly accessible way, and there will be two different versions. One special version adaptable to vulnerable population needs. Um, so the, the point is that we, we try to support the right of people to get adequately informed while improving the quality and effectiveness of interactions between the research community, the policymakers, and stakeholders, and also vulnerable population. Okay. So here you can find a kind of uh, of summary of our outcomes. Okay, and uh, you can see the different users and the main characteristics of uh, each and every of these uh, main outcomes. Um, well, it's important to, to underline that we will try to produce all these materials uh, thanks to a co-creation approach that it's based on, 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 on a real need to involve all social actors. So um, the point is that we will be continuously engaging people in different activities. So we got a lot of different activities to be performed. And uh, once we will produce them, the main graphs of our outcomes, we will celebrate some kind of encounters, for example, with different um, representatives of the collectives involved, just to check if they work well and improve them, okay, if needed be. Um, yes, as uh, the other two projects, we are very interested in dissemination and communication, of course, it's very important to produce um, high impact, and that's one of the main challenges that we are focused. And uh, so Panofit is, uh, has, uh, described, has described a lot of different ways to achieve this kind of impact. And you could check a look at that. We, of course, we will, we will produce academic papers. We will, we will be in panels and organize panels in academic conferences. We will hold academic courses to organize them. But there will also be lots of face-to-face -face training courses, mock courses, webinars, and um, encounters, as I previously said, and the workshops with lots of uh, stakeholders. And we will also have a kind of uh, final dissemination events. There will be four events to be held in Cold, in Vienna, in Madrid, and in Brussels. That will be the main. And we really hope that we will be able to uh, raise awareness of our project and what are its main um, products or outcomes. And this is just some. Um, um, uh, slide showing who are the organizations that are involved here on in this project. You can see that we are 13, two data protection agencies are involved, for instance, and there are 
also a work is a part of our project and we also have representatives from NGOs and uh, science associations and so on. So um, I think uh, this is more or less the most important thing that I should tell you. I think that uh, I've done well in time and uh, we are really looking forward to receiving your feedback and you will all be much welcome if you want to receive all the information about Panapit. So thank you so much to everyone and that's all. Thank you. So thank you all. Uh, we will end the webinar now and we will all let you know when it's available on YouTube for you to watch again. Thank you so much. Goodbye.